so, yeah, so there's just some, anyway, just really, really good things. Today, we're going to be continuing our series about Believe. And I want to give a shout out right now to especially those of you that are down in South Florida. Uh, welcome to you guys that are right there. Man, I love you guys. I can't wait to come down and see some of you. I'll see some of you guys at our breakthrough that's coming up, which is going to be really good. I want to also welcome all of, all of you that are over in Auditorium A right now, uh, everybody that's watching online. And if you've got a Bible, just take it and, and kind of put your finger on Genesis 20 and everybody shout the word Believe. believe. Today we're going to talk about healing. Now everyone say healing. All right, I'm going to acknowledge on the front end right now, there is such a thing as the placebo effect. I acknowledge right now there is the power of suggestion. I acknowledge right now there is an adrenaline rush that can happen where someone doesn't feel something as much. I totally get that there are very natural processes whereby people experience alleviation from pain and things like that. But I'm here to let you know right now that today I'm going to be speaking about the miraculous, supernatural power of God through Jesus that can even manifest itself in this world, in this these bodies, and today I'm going to present to you the Jesus who knows how to heal people. Smith Wigglesworth one time was on a train, and while he was there, there was a mother and a daughter that got on, and they were very sick, uh, very ill, and so he began to speak to them and said, listen, I have access to something that actually uh, can cure anything, anyone's disease on this planet. They were interested. They said, well, would you tell us about that? He said, sure. He reached into a bag. He took out his Bible, and he read where it says in Exodus, I am the Lord who healeth thee. Today, I want to talk about the Lord that heals us. Now, as I'm going into this, I want to acknowledge to you that there is such a thing as, as a, a sickness that can do something to you because when you are broken, when you are infirmed, when you are ill, something bad happens. When I was a youth pastor, we had a kid that was always acting out, and I remember um, just trying to get to the bottom of what was going on, and sure enough, his father was pretty abusive. In fact, his father was really abusive, and at what really was taking place was that this father lived in a state of chronic pain. At one point, he just finally apologized to his son and said, son, you're going to have to forgive me. I just have been such a fraction of myself for so long because of this pain. It's almost like when, you're in, when you are injured, when you are in pain, when you're chronically ill, like if you've ever broken an arm, all you have to do is put a little bit of pressure on there and that same arm that could have handled a load of pressure now can handle very little pressure because when you are sick, when you are uh, infirmed, when you are broken, even the same amount of pressure is going to make you much more sensitive because ever since the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned, they didn't just get separated from God, they were separated from their wholeness. We were separated from our wholeness and there's a weakness about us. There's a lack of endurance about us. There's a, a, a lack of, of a ability to withstand certain things and today we're going to go and we're going to just have a session where we're going to be thinking here for a little while about the God who heals and I would just like there to be faith on this day today. Are we in agreement on that? That today there shall be faith. Are we in agreement? Yes. So Father, I'm asking today that there will be a faith in South Florida, North Florida, all Florida, all whoever listens to this in the Middle East, that this today will be a day of faith that moves mountains in Jesus' name. Amen. Point number one. I'm going to get into Genesis 20, but I'm going to start here. Point number one, God heals. I've got one big idea today. It's going to be broken up into three segments. Number one, God heals. I'm going to start there because I want to acknowledge to you uh, an awkward boldness of the scripture as it relates to God being a healer. I also want to say to you that when I speak to people about healing, we have an awkwardness because most people when it comes to physical healing, they do not start with scripture, they start with our experience. In most parts of theology, what we would say is, don't give me your experience, start with the Bible, start with the scriptures, and starting with scripture, then you go and apply the scripture to your experience, to your reality. But when it comes to healing, what I hear people say is, I asked for healing, I didn't get healed, therefore that verse must not mean that God heals, or that must not mean this. And so what we've done is we've retroactively interpreted scripture in the light of our experience instead of confronting our experience in light of scripture. I'm just letting you know in our church, we believe in starting with scripture, not starting with experience. If someone comes to me and says, God told me something and it doesn't line up with the Bible, I don't care what you think God told you, we go with the Bible. We go with scripture. Number one, God heals. 
I got an email last week from a precious sister that, um, a few weeks ago, from a fr- precious sister in the, in the body that's just really been infirmed and struggled and, uh, and just ridden with pain and um, j- just troubled, you know, just really troubled with this, had, had received prayer, uh, asking God to heal, thought she was doing better, did a follow-up checkup at the doctor, found out not only is she not doing better, she's actually doing worse, to which she then asks me, Pastor Mike, does this mean God isn't healing me? Is this God's way of saying no? Should I even ask for prayer anymore? I've already asked for prayer so many times. Should I just stop asking for prayer because it's not happening? Is God saying no? Is that what God is saying right now? How would you answer that person? What do you do when you thought you were, I mean, she's like, man, I thought I was doing better. My, my friends are pregnant. We all thought I was doing, we believed I was doing better. And I'm not just not doing better. I'm actually doing worse. Mike, what would you say? Well, I'm, I'm going to get there, but let me just start by saying, number one, God heals. I'm going to read you some scripture. Psalm 103, starting in verse one, says this. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget, not don't forget all his benefits. Now everyone say benefits. Hey, if you're in South Florida, say benefits. So if you're at a job and your employer offers you full scale, platinum level health insurance, you don't go out and buy your own policy on the side, correct? Because you've got a benefit. But when it comes to this, I would submit to you, there are many benefits in the kingdom of God that God has already provided them. He's already paid for them. He's already brought them at our disposal and we're going out and seeking other places. Don't forget all of his benefits. Well, what would those benefits be? Well, here it is, verse three. It says, who forgives all of your iniquity. Now, iniquity means sin. It's like our sin nature. He forgives all of your iniquity, all of your sins. Can I just give us some great news? There is no sin God will not, cannot, shall not forgive. God forgives all sin. And man, churches are bold to say this. Who forgives all of your iniquity. And then we get to this comma. And then we kind of go like, who forgives all your diseases? (laughs) What what did you say? Who who, who forgives all your diseases? What was that? (laughs) Who forgives all of your sins and and who, who heals maybe perhaps all of your diseases But what this really means, because that's not our experience, is that maybe it's got to mean something else. I'm not so sure what that means. So we kind of skip over it. So what we do is we hit the first part of this verse, like with potency, but the second half, we're not sure. Because of our experience, we're not sure if that really applies. We're not sure what that means in the original language. What did that mean in the original Hebrew? What might that mean? I'll tell you what it means. It means he forgives all of your sins and he heals all of our diseases. That's what it means. In Psalm chapter 30, the same author, he apparently had this as his experience in Psalm 30 verse 2. He said, oh Lord my God, I cried to you for help and you have healed me. Now now let me just do a quick timeout. I thank God for the natural process of restoration that happens in a body. There's rehab, okay? Someone breaks a bone, they put in a cast and that thing heals up. You give it six weeks and it gets better. I thank God and if someone's thinking that this is what he's talking about, I do not think that's what he's talking about. I do thank God that you get a cut, you give it a few days, it naturally gets better. That's not the same thing as Logan. You know, that's not the same thing as, you know, the Wolverine. You know, we're talking Jesus has stuff better than Wolverine's got, all right? That Jesus has that kind of thing where I remember I was in this very room. If you're in South Florida in Auditorium A, I was in Auditorium B right here at this location where I have seen with my own eyes people that I personally know who were injured playing sports in full cast get prayed for and those broken bones that had six more weeks to go on a six and a half week recovery on the spot healed, go back to the doctor. The doctor has no explanation. X-rays to prove it. The cast comes off and she walks to school the next day oh lord my god i cried to you for help and you have healed me thank the lord that he made our bodies that if you break a bone it's not like well chop it off that we done I'm glad that if you get a sprained ankle, the ankle can naturally heal. I don't think that's not what we're describing here. Just like forgiveness is a miracle, healing is a miracle. God, I am the Lord who heals, he says. 
This was the experience. This was the promise of, of Exodus chapter 15, verse 26, when he says, I am the Lord who heals you. It's part of the covenant of being in covenant with God's people. Over in Isaiah 53, this was a prophecy. He says, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The ch- upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. Now again, no one's got any problem in the world going through and saying, he was our transgressions, our sins. Man, Jesus, he was wounded. This is a prophecy about the Messiah. This is talking about Jesus. Let me brag on Jesus for a minute. Jesus was wounded so your transgressions could be deleted. He was crushed for our iniquities. Man, guys, do you know this? Auditory mate, do you realize? He was crushed for your iniquity, your sin, your lust, your pride, your greed. Crushed. He was crushed for that. Thank God we have a Savior, that, a Messiah. that would, He was the chastisement. He was chastised for our peace. He deserved no chastisement. He was chastised to bring a... Everyone preaches part one of this? Yes. He was wounded. Yes. Crushed. Yes. Peace was upon... Yes. But then we get to this next... We hit this comma. And now we balk. Now we freak out. Now we have this awkwardness. Uh-oh. Awkward. Don't know what to do. When my reality doesn't line up, I'm tempted to kind of take out part D of this verse. And with his stripes were healed. And then people try to spiritualize this. Well, what it's referring to is the spiritual healing that takes place one day when you're in heaven where all things shall be healed. That doesn't sound like great news. If you're on this earth and you're suffering really badly and you're a guy that's, that's sick or infirm like a blind Bartimaeus and say to Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus doesn't go to him and say, I will have mercy on you. Here you go. Say a sinner's prayer with me. And when you go to heaven, you're, when, when you die, you're going to go to heaven and you'll get eyes in heaven, but you don't have eyes. That's not what he did. Bartimaeus goes to him. Jesus looks at him. Jesus prays for him. And guess what happens to the blind man? He sees. I want to let some of you know, this is a kingdom that's available. The kingdom of God is now at hand. Mike, do you have an explanation of why everyone doesn't get healed? Nope, and I'm not even going to try. Do you have an explanation of why things haven't happened yet? Nope, I preach for a couple straight weeks on the gap. There are promises. There's a gap between the promises and the fulfillment. I'm not going to explain the gap. What I'm going to tell you is this. There is a God who has described himself and revealed himself as the God who heals. Matthew chapter 11, verse 5. We've got John the baptizer. He's the greatest prophet there's ever been. He's taken a stand for Jesus. He's taken a hit for Jesus. Because of Jesus, he's now in jail. He's about to be killed. He's about to literally lose his head. His head is about to get chopped off. He's on the chopping block, ready to die. And he's kind of wondering now, I predicted you are the Messiah. Please tell me I'm correct. And so he sends some people to Jesus and says to them, Hey, Jesus, are you the one that's coming or not? Because if you're not the one that's coming, I in jail for a stupid reason. I got to know if you're the guy. Do you feel it? This is how Jesus responds. Go tell John, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the good news preached to them. In other words, according to Jesus, the sign of the kingdom of God is that people get healed and the dead get raised. Oh, and by the way, the gospel does get preached to the poor. You know what we've done now? Like the 21st century American church in many ways has whittled the gospel, whittled the kingdom of God down to nothing but the gospel being preached to rich people, not even the poor, and leave out all the other stuff about the lepers get cleansed and the sick get healed. Do you understand that this kingdom is so real that your peace comes because of it? Your body can be restored because of it? It, your family can get restored because the kingdom of God is here. <laughs> In Revelation chapter 22, I'm just trying to give you a snapshot. I could have given you, I could have spent 30 minutes on this just to give you a snapshot of cover to cover from beginning to end. God's provision has been for healing. In Revelation 22, 1 and 2, it says, The angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life. With its 12 kinds of fruit. What? The tree of life has 12 kinds of fruit. Yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. I am the Lord who heals you. I am the Lord who heals. See, some of us believe that he is the God who saves us and he does. But the same God who is Savior is also the healer. Some of us, we know him as Savior We know him as redeemer. We've not yet met him as healer. And today, I'd like to introduce you to the rest of your God. He is the God who heals. 
God heals, number one. Number two, but God heals through people. God heals through people. And today we pick up Genesis chapter 20 where we're going to get the story of Abraham. Verse 1. From there Abraham journeyed towards the territory of the Negev and lived between Kadesh and Shur. And he sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. Now, we got a problem here. Because we're about to read a passage where Abraham is now, and you're going to see how this kind of talks to healing before we're done. But Abraham is now, he's married to Sarah for the second time. You didn't just read this twice. We saw this several weeks ago in another sermon. For the second time, when push came to shove and Abraham was scared, he told, apparently, <laughs> apparently Sarah's got some good genes because she's like totally a card-carrying member of AARP and she is still a fine woman to where everywhere they go, Abraham's like, man, the woman looks good and he's afraid for his life because someone will, so he says, tell them you're my sister so they'll treat me good. And sure enough, that's what he does again for the second time. What I want you to see is God's going to use Abraham to heal people and he's going to do it in a chapter where Abraham could not be more far from perfect. This is good news because God heals through people but people are a problem because people are imperfect. And I just need you to know right now, if you're in here thinking to yourself today, Mike, I'm too imperfect for God to use me. God specializes in using imperfect people. Look at the person next to you. Say, you qualify. Verse 3. But God came to Abimelech. That was the king of this place. God so Abimelech, king of Gerar, he sent and took Sarah. Verse 3. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said, Behold. You're a dead man. Now just time out. That'd be a bummer. If God shows up in a dream and says, hey, yo, you're dead. You're a dead man. It's like, what, what? I mean, here's Abimelech, this king in this area. Abraham doesn't even think he's got a relationship with God. A little, little aside here as well. Do you understand that there are people that have a relationship with God that you don't even know have a relationship with God? Do you understand that there are people that hear God's voice that you wouldn't even know? You just might be assuming they don't. Oh, Mike, oh, I, I know what church they go to. Oh, I know what kind. Do you understand that God knows how to speak to in dreams and all sorts? God is so able to do what he does even without your counsel. <laughs> you ever tried to give God your advice? Lord, let me tell you how I would do it. This is wild to me. Behold, you're a dead man. And because of the woman, because of the woman that you've taken, for she is a man's wife. Another quick time out real quick. I need you to understand something today. There are laws that apply in the universe, whether you acknowledge them or not. There are laws that apply whether you voted on it or not. There are laws that apply whether the United States of America acknowledges it or not. There are laws that apply just because there is a lawgiver and God has spoken. He does not stutter. And God has said, you're not to go lie with this man. So you're a dead man. The wages of sin is death. To which he says, wait a minute. Look at this. I didn't even know what was going on. Lord, will you kill an innocent man? Verse 4. Did he not himself say to me, she's my sister and she herself said he's my brother. In the integrity of my heart and in the innocence of my hands, I've done this. Then God said to him, yes, I know that you've done this in the integrity of your heart. And it is I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I didn't let you touch her. In other words, tomorrow he was ready to get up and get it on. And God says, totally inappropriate. God says, no, I won't let you do that. See, this reminds me of an Acts, the book of Acts, where it says, God overlooked men's innocence in times past, but he has now commanded men everywhere to repent. Maybe you're here and there's things that you just didn't know. I remember we had a couple that, that was here in the, in, in the church and, and I was preaching one day and this couple, they've been coming for a little while and, and I just said, I, I mentioned that you're not supposed to, uh, you know, God says don't have sexual relations with someone until you're married. And the guy's like, he looks at her and she looks at him and they came up to me and they're like, are you serious? <laughs> they're like, does the Bible say that? I'm like, yeah, like, can you show us that? I'm like, well, it's in like a lot of places. And, <laughs> and they're like, they looked at me and they said, do people do that? Like, can people do that? I'm like, they can. And like, oh my gosh, like, but I love God and God says don't do this. I'm like, listen, bro, God overlooked your ignorance in time past. Now he's telling you to repent. And in, in defense of him, he's like, man, I'll try, you know? I don't know where he's like, we sleep in the same bed. I'm like, well, well we could start there. You know, we might need to do something about that. He's like, 
Like, like how? Like, what would we do? I'm like, uh, well, and I'm not going to tell you the rest of that story, but. <laughs> but he did. He repented. You know, maybe there's even some of you. Maybe today is your final warning. You know what? You've been playing. You've been playing things where you shouldn't be. And today God is saying, I've kept you from making the mistakes that you shouldn't have made. And today I'm telling you, turn to me. Trust me. Follow me. Therefore, I didn't let you touch it. Verse seven, then, then, now then, return the man's wife, for he's a prophet, so that he will pray for you and you shall live. Now, another time out here real quick. Return the man's wife, for he's a prophet. To which if I'm Abimelech, I'm like, he may be a prophet, but the man is a punk. <laughs> I don't like the fact that God uses punks. I wish God only used, maybe not perfect people, but almost perfect people. I mean, there's some people, they're not perfect, but they're like way better than average. And then when I'm looking at Abraham, I read Abraham's life and I'm like, you're not just not way better than average. I don't even think you're average. Why would God choose someone like you? It, it, it's one of the things that has most bothered me about God, the lascivious nature of the grace of God. Why do you consistently choose people who don't deserve it? And then I look in the mirror and I'm like, oh, that's right. That's what it was again. That's my only shot. Because when I'm having a good day, I get really judgmental. But when I'm having a bad day, there's this balm of comfort that I have that God does not require someone that has a perfect background. He requires a person who just believes. He just believes him. God, we just believe you. Let there be faith. Even now, let there be faith. Some of you right now, you're like, Mike, I'm sick and I deserve it. I don't deserve to be healed. See, God doesn't heal people because they deserve it. God heals people because he's good. God doesn't save people because they're perfect. He saves them because he's good. See, God heals, but here's one of his laws. He does it through people. He does it through, God has set up the universe in such a way that in the beginning, God created humans in his image. It's called the image of God. In the image of God, he made the male and female. He made them. And in Genesis 1, it says, into humanity, he invested dominion. He has granted humans dominion. That means that God will act on planet earth, but you've got to catch this. He only works through people. That's the only way God works on earth. So I hear people all the time saying things like, well, God can do anything. God can do anything, but he has revealed that the way he does anything is through people. So a lot of times I'll hear people that are sitting around saying things like, well, I'm just waiting on God. But oftentimes if you could hear the angels, they'd say, hey, people, God's waiting on you. Because God has revealed that he chooses to do things through humans. Oh, Lord, feed all those sick kids on the other side of the world. He says, I will. Guess who? Through you. It's God. Through, see, God heals through people. See, see we, we, we functionally tend to believe that it's, it's by, by works. We, we believe that God will use people if they've been good and morally upright. I remember Pastor Lastinger was telling me one time, he said, you know, Mike, I was in a service back in the, it was the 50s or 60s, and there was a healing service going on, and there was a man that had such an anointing to heal people. There was a child that had a stub leg. The stub leg kid could not walk on Christ just half a leg and this healing pastor whatever says we're going to pray for the sick he goes and he prays and this kid's leg starts growing and growing and growing I don't just mean like an inch I mean like inches to where like from the knee down this kid goes by the end of the service he is healed and running around this room and pastor last was like what in the world it was like what you hear about in the bible because what you hear about in the bible can actually happen and then there was he would have these words of knowledge and God will give these sometimes and he would be like 14 rows back three people over you are are you a school teacher? She's like, oh my gosh, how does he know that? You, you your, your shoulder, you've had a shoulder injury for how long? She's like, he's like, how do I know that? Because God just healed it. Move your shoulder right now. And she's like, oh my God, all over the room, all these healings and power. And he said, it was incredible. He said, Mike, you know what was hard? The man ends up dying of a disease that he got because he was living a completely immoral lifestyle. To which I'm like, God, why do you use people like that? And then I look in the mirror again, and I remember. Because if he won't 
pour out his grace and his power by nothing but by, his, by faith in him alone, then I'm disqualified and you're disqualified and we're dis- See, God heals through people. Look, look at verse eight here. It says, so Abimelech rose early in the morning. He called all his servants and told them all these things. And the men were very much afraid. You're all dead. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, what have you done to us? How have I sinned against you that you've brought on me and my kingdom a great sin? You've not, you've not done things to me that, that ought not to be done. That's what you've done. And Abimelech said to Abraham, what did you see that you did these things? And Abraham said, I did it because I thought there was no fear of God at all in this place. And they would kill me because of my wife. It's like, oh, clearly you fear the Lord. Look at you. You fear the Lord, right? Besides, she is indeed my sister, the daughter of my father, through not, though not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. I feel like I'm watching Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back right now. That's what I feel like I'm doing. I don't know if any of you saw that movie. When, when Obi-Wan Kenobi, you know, says, you know, Luke, you know, Darth Vader was an evil man. He, he got turned to the, to the dark side. He killed your father. But then by the time you get to episode, th- whatever, the, whatever that episode was, you know, with the Ewok episode, by the time you get to that episode, he comes and he goes to me and says, wait a minute, Darth Vader didn't just kill my father. Darth Vader is my father. To which he's like, well... That he's like, why do you tell me? He's like, well, it's true from a certain point of view. To which looks like, from a certain point of view, that's what I feel like I'm getting right here. When he says, well, she is my sister from a certain point of view. To which he's like, no, are you married to her? Like, is that your wife? Well, technically, he's like, I hope you understand there is hope for you. I mean, some of you, like, you talk about a dysfunctional family. When I read this story, I'm like, God, this is the dude that you choose to redeem the world through? Was there no better option? (laughs) Man, (laughs) what a wild story this Abraham story is. Mm, mm, mm. And, and when God calls me to wander, verse 13, from my father's house, I said to her, this is the kindness that you must do to me at every place where we go. Save me. He's my brother. Then Abimelech took sheep and oxen and male servants and female servants, gave them to Abraham, returned Sarah to his wife to him. And Abimelech said, behold, my land is before you. In other words, get out of my face, please. Dwell where it pleases you. To Sarah, he said, behold, I've given your brother and a thousand pieces of silver. It is a sign of your, inno- of your innocence in the eyes of all who are with you and before everyone that you are vindicated. Then And Abraham prayed to God and God healed. God does the healing. Abraham does the praying. God heals through people. I got to make this clear to you. I want to make sure you understand this. God can do anything, but he has chosen to do things through humans. He has chosen to do things through humans. See, Abraham is having a very hard time learning the lesson that God told him over in Genesis 12 when he said, Abraham, I will make your name great. I will bless you, but I'm blessing you to be a blessing. Abraham, I'm going to bless you so that in you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Church, let me cast some vision to you, man. God has put his blessing on us. And if you belong to Jesus, there's a blessing on you. But he did not bless you you to sit on the blessing. He did not bless you to go into lie to Abimelechs of the world. He blessed you so that your very life would be a blessing to the nations, Abraham. I read this story and I'm freaking out. I'm like, what? God tells Abimelech, go get Abraham to pray for you. Abraham is a prophet, to which I'm like, he's a prophet? He's a jerk. He's a swindler. He's deceptive. And you say he's a prophet and here's the principle that you've got to understand. Here's what you've got to grasp. This is what you've got to comprehend. If you're in Auditorium A, if you're in South Florida right now, you've got to catch this. God puts authority inside of his people. Abraham is a prophet and resident with the calling of a prophet is an authority. There is an authority that you get when you come to Jesus or you've got authority not because you're in the most faithful chapter of your life, not because you're having the best day of your life, not because you had enough quiet times this week. You do not have power because you read your Bible enough this week. You do not have power because you have been completely honest. You've got power because the king of the universe has said that if you belong to him, he is inside of you and greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. Do you understand the authority that you've got? Church, rise up in your authority, man. Use the authority that God has given you, woman of God. You've got authority. Do you understand? But people get impressed with demons. Demons tremble at the presence that you've got. 
Do you understand? He's a prophet. He doesn't deserve to be a prophet. He's a prophet because God chose him. Listen, man, you do not have authority from God because of your faithfulness. You've got authority of God because of the cross and the blood and the resurrection of Jesus, and he's inside of you. The, what's the problem with sin? The problem with sin is you become schizophrenic, spiritually speaking, and you won't walk in it. What I'm here to tell you is this. This chapter proves God will use the most imperfect of people because the power was him all along. God heals, but he does it through Man, I hope when you go out this week, when you're on a bus and you see someone sick, I hope you take your hand and you say, can I pray for you? And if they say no, you say, okay. And you just go ahead and pray anyway, you know, but you don't have to lay your hands on them. But if someone says yes at, the, at, at lunch today, unless you're at the connection lunch, uh, something like that, if you're, I don't know if you guys are doing a connection lunch, it's helpful, but whatever it is that you're doing, it's like if you will go and say, Jesus, use my life right now to touch this person. See, God heals. It's God. It's God. Glory to God. All the glory to God. All the power is from God, but he uses people. You're just the pipe. Pipes don't brag about the, the power that flows through them. You're a pipe. You're a wire. You can say, well, I feel like I'm going to take all the glory. No, man. <laughs> the way you take the glory is when you stop the power from flow. God heals through people. See, see the purpose, the, 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 the way all this happens, the mechanism is faith. It happens by faith. I'm hoping to stir your, your, your mind right now to faith. You've got authority from God. Believe. All you've got to do is believe. When it comes to sicknesses, for example, all you need to do is believe. The problem is we have a hard time believing, so what God does is he gives us little extra, I call them spiritual technologies on earth. What do you mean? I mean things like the prayer of agreement. Jesus said things like sometimes you need to pray in agreement. What is that? That doesn't mean that you don't have enough power in and of yourself to do it. What it means is, I think, there are sometimes your faith is kind of weak. You ever kind of been weak in your faith? Someone else comes alongside you. They get next to you like, man, man, God's going to come through. It's kind of like a coach. When a coach is there and calls things out, like, man, God's about to show up. And you're like, yeah, Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus. Lord, throw your power into this place right now. Yeah. And the power of, a, see, the, the issue isn't that there's somehow mysterious uh, something else because someone else got in the mix. I think the issue is there are sometimes two are better than one because their faith gets activated. Same thing with the prayer. What's up with when James says, is anyone among you sick? Go before the elders. They will anoint you with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer of the faith will save the sick. Well, do, can you not just ask God for yourself? Of course you could. I think what this means is like when my oldest child had asthma for years and we prayed, I prayed, nothing happened. I finally said, I said, I got to bump this up to the next level up. I bumped it up to our pastor who is the elder of the church. I come up to, we had, you know, elders there. I said, and he takes out the oil, anoints her with oil. She had had asthma for years, prays for her on the spot. She gets healed, has never had asthma again. Wow. You could say, what well, was a placebo? It's been like a 14 year placebo. That was a good placebo. <laughs> What's the point? I think the point is there are sometimes you might not have the faith where you need to go on something, but then you've got some spiritual leader that's got perspective. I mean, by the way, haven't you seen this yourself? There are sometimes uh, someone else tells you a problem and you give them your advice when you're on the outside. It's so clear what they need to do. You've got so much confidence God's going to come through. You're like, man, girl, you got this. Are you kidding me? Oh my gosh. God's totally, and you've got so much faith. And when it's you, you have a hard time believing because you're so much in the middle of it, which is why I think something that God does is he sends people and leaders outside of you. It's not that there's a secret to a pastor. It's all faith. The issue is sometimes an elder can help you believe. Same thing with fasting, by the way. There was a case in the Bible where there was a guy that had his, uh, a child that was messed up and he brought him to the disciples and they couldn't get the kid not messed up. And, and they're like, oh my gosh, they tried, they prayed, but nothing happened. And then he went to, the, went to Jesus and he said, Jesus, I, you know, I prayed and, and uh, your disciples couldn't do anything. This is right after he'd been on like the transfiguration, Mount of Transfiguration. He comes back down. You know, I had, you know, there was like nine of them trying to pray, nothing happened. What's up? And Jesus is like, oh man, it's a faith problem. Where's your faith? He, he identified the problem, lack of faith. But then he said, but some kind only come out by prayer and fasting. Well, what is it? Is it prayer and fasting or is it faith? Well, the answer is it's faith. But the point is sometimes fasting and prayer will activate your faith in ways that just praying alone doesn't. Because the issue is always faith. All you need is faith. You're saved by grace through faith. You're healed by grace through faith. You, are, you grow by grace through faith. That's how you do it. It's all by faith. It's all faith in Jesus. But what happens is when you fast, you get focused. See, 
Faith is a focus. You can either focus on your problem or you can focus on the promises of God. And when you are focused on the promises of God, there is a faith. It's actually possible to pray more focused on your problems than on the promises of God. This is what I believe it means to pray in a double-minded way. When you are praying to God but focused on your problems, I think you're a double-minded man or woman, unstable in all of your ways, and you can actually pray prayers that will not be answered because you are not praying in faith. Faith is a focus on the goodness of God and the promises of God, which is why the best way to pray is when your eyes are on the, fo- on the promises, when your mind is on the promises, when your soul is on the promises, not the problem. Someone's like, girl, man, we are going through it. Things are going down. Things are bad. We got money problems. We got sugar problems. We got high blood pressure. I got, pr- okay, that's not how we're praying. Here's what I'm going to say. I'm coming and saying, what does the word say? I'm going to pray from the word of God. I'm going to pray from heaven. I'm not praying from earth. And so I'm going to come. Oh, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. I'm lifting my gaze up to you. May your kingdom come on the earth. Uh, Do you see what Jesus is doing? He immediately takes your focus off the problem onto the promises, and that's where the power comes. It's, it's, It's not, watch, fasting, fasting doesn't twist God's arm. Like, you're not punishing yourself. Like, oh God, I'll punish myself to get you to answer my prayer. What fasting does is when you're fasting, you're not eating. And so while you're not eating, you focus on the word of God in prayer. And the more you do that, the more you're on the promises. Fasting just gets you in touch with your faith. If your faith is always kicking on full gear, you'd probably never need to fast. But what happens is people like me need to go fast sometimes because I need to get my mind back on those promises of God. I'll tell you one more. I was, heard a story this week of um, a little kid that was sick and you know, just, just in a bad spot or whatever. And the mom started to pray and, and the kids just like, no, no, mom, stop, stop, stop. stop. She interrupts the mom. She said, don't pray like that. Pray in that language I don't understand. Because whenever you pray in that language I don't understand, that's when God always answers your prayers. <laughs> You always have power when you pray like that. Well, actually, the Bible says in the book of Jude that we are to pray in the Holy Spirit. It says building yourself up in your most holy faith. There are some times you need to build yourself up in your most holy faith. This is what's called praying in the spirit. 1 Corinthians 14 says more about this. Paul said, I will pray with my mind. I will also pray with my spirit. I will pray in a language I understand. I'll also pray in another tongue. I'm going to pray in these other ways because sometimes someone comes up and they're like, hey, Pastor Mike, can you pray for me? Man, we just heard, I, I got cancer. I'm like, oh man, I can pray, but could you give me a second? To, and I hate to say kind of warming it up, but there are times that my faith needs to get activated. I'm like, can you give me a minute to go ahead and get my mind off of the problem on earth onto the promises of heaven so that when I'm praying, I'm moving from a position of power, not a position of weakness. God heals through people. I dare you to step out. Last point, God heals through people by grace through faith. Abraham prays to God and God heals Abimelech. And he also healed his wife and female slaves so that they all bore children for the Lord had closed all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Because of, it's an interesting word. Mike, why am I sick right now? Mike, how come my sickness has not been healed? How come my mom died? My Aunt Betty, I just, we buried my Aunt Betty. We finished Easter last week and I had to go down to South Florida. We buried my very precious Aunt Betty in South Florida this week. Mike, why, why did this person not make it? It reminds me of in John chapter 9, there was, there was a man that was born blind. And the question asked to Jesus was, Lord, who sinned? Was it his parent that sinned to make him blind or was it him? And I love Jesus' answer. Neither one. This is for the glory of God. There might even be some of you right now that are like, Mike, I'm, I'm infirmed, I'm sick, my family's got a problem. Who sinned? Who sinned? I mean, if you wonder who sinned, we all have sinned. But I want to twist it a little bit here because what if this is for the glory of God? What if God's intention is to use this for his very glory? See, God does not heal because we're faithful. God doesn't heal because we've been infallible. God heals because he is good. God heals because it's who he is. God is a healer. God is the healer. God is the one who heals us in the deepest parts, both inside and outside. Even in the chapter, verse 20, where Abraham has been as unfaithful as you can be, as despicable as could be, as dishonorable as could be, when he prays, Abimelech's whole household gets healed. What? 
See, God is trying to get his attention. Church, I want to use you to go bless this world. I want to use you to lay hands on this world. I want to use you to let people that have never had babies, that are going to have babies. In fact, even right now, if you're watching me right now and you're in South Florida and you've not conceived and you want to have a baby, in the name of Jesus, receive power to conceive in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. I'm praying this very weekend right now that there will be people that are HIV positive that you will be healed. You might say, well, Mike, you don't understand. I, I contracted HIV and it was, it was my own fault. God doesn't heal because you were worthy. He heals because Jesus was worthy. Do you understand this? Do you understand that people don't get healed because they are upright? They get healed because Jesus is upright? I'm praying that there are people that are in this room right now that have cancer some of you that are in auditorium A, some of you in South Florida with cancer reports, that that cancer is going to disappear and be gone in Jesus' name. That some of you that have had malfunctioning parts of your body, hear this in faith, may those parts that have malfunctioned now function in Jesus' name. Receive strength. Receive power. See, God heals through people, by grace, through faith. I think of Heidi Baker. She's over in Mozambique, and she's spending her life with the poor and the needy. They have thousands of orphans, and they just the way they plant churches, they just go into places, and they do miracles. They start churches by going into a place, and they do miracles first. Once the miracles have been done, the chiefs give them permission to start churches, and then they start churches. Because they're like, oh yeah, who's gonna, how, how do we argue with this power? And so she was talking recently. There was a lot of the little kids. It was like Christmas time, I think, and there was a bunch of presents that were brought for them, and, and all of a sudden, she, some, this person, benefactor, brings in these gifts, and she asked the children, what would you like, little kids? And the person's like, no, no, don't ask them what they want. We just got a bag of gifts. Just give them what we got, you know? And she's like, no, what would you guys like? And they say, we'd all like beads. They love making things with beads. We love beads. We love beads. And the person's like, no, 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 we don't have beads. She's like, hey, just daddy God is good. And she, she understands that we have dominion, that we live on the earth, but we are from the kingdom of heaven. And when you have faith on earth as it is in heaven becomes your MO. Yes. So she prays, Lord, will you give these children the desire of their hearts? Give these little kids beads. They open the bags and guess what's inside? Beads. And the kids are going crazy. And the person's like, how? What? Who? His name is Jesus, and he loves people enough to give little orphans in Mozambique who can't get anything else, the desire of their heart, and he gives them beads. Why? See, see, God heals, but he heals through people, but he does it because he's loving. He does it because he's good. Do you understand? He loves us way more than we can fathom. Do you understand your sin problems are love problems? You don't get out of your sin because you don't grasp his love. If you knew his love, man, you'd run for you like, sin, forget that. Ridiculous. See, God heals through people by grace through faith. See, he does this through a, it's, it's through an ultimate person. See, it had to be a person. It, on earth, the earth was given over to humans and because humans blew it, humans would have to unblow it, which is why Jesus comes to earth. Do you understand that when Jesus comes and is born of a virgin, this matters, guys, because we need someone that's fully human to be able to exercise the dominion that's been handed over to humans, but we need someone that's as wise as God to know actually what to do about this. So where do you find someone that's got the wisdom wisdom and goodness and virtue of God, but that's got the, the flesh and blood of humans. And the answer is, it was found in the virgin womb of a woman named Mary, and he's born of this virgin. He lives this perfect life in Jesus, who is fully God and fully man. And it's mysterious. It's the mystery of the God, of God himself. It's the mystery that he would come in flesh. He would be Messiah, that God did not simply delegate the mission to another prophet or another priest or another angel. God took matters into his own hands, and he gave himself. It's the grace of God. Do you understand that the early church was not going out and preaching to people, hey, everybody. You know what? It's going to really be a bummer if you go to hell when you die. So what you need to do is say a little prayer. And if you'll say a little prayer, when you die, you're going to go to heaven. And people are like, oh, great consolation prize. My life's terrible here on earth, but at least I go to heaven when I die. That's, read the book of Acts. They don't even mention going to heaven when you die. It's not that there's not a heaven. There is a heaven when you die. Scripture's full of that. What they were saying was this, the kingdom of Jesus is now available. The authority of Jesus is now available. And something changed on the Friday 
that we celebrated just a few weeks ago, something changed on that day when Jesus went to the cross. Do you understand that by about 6 o'clock, on somewhere around the 15th of Nisan, somewhere around 33 AD, by about 6 p.m., things fundamentally changed in the universe. There was an emancipation proclamation that went from heaven that said, you can now be free. See, we say, this, we say this about sin. Evangelical Christians are real big on, oh, God, will for, I mean, you'll talk to Christians. Like one guy, they asked him, like, hey, when did you get saved? He said, 2,000 years ago. Theologically accurate. But then you ask people things like, well, when did you get healed? And then this is what they say. Well, when I get to heaven. And yet when you read 1 Peter 2.24, it says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that you might live to righteousness, die to sin, and by his stripes you were, past tense, healed, accomplished. In other words, when Jesus said it is finished, he didn't just take the first domino of sin. And to be sure, there is no greater gift than the forgiveness of sins because to know that where you stand with God and know where you're going to go to be with God, when that domino falls, you can have peace with God. It's amazing. But I got to tell you, there are more dominoes that fall because when the domino of forgiveness falls, there's a bunch of deliverance, oppression goes away, injustices can be addressed, and by his stripes, you were healed. That's what the early church preached. That's what the early church preached. That something happened on the cross where things are different than they used to be. I need you to know, friends, because of Jesus, fully God, fully man, comes to the cross, dies, a sinless life, was buried and rose from the dead. When Jesus rose, something big happened. And I end it like this. Heidi Baker, the same lady, was out one day in her little village and there was a woman. She goes up to this woman and she just sits by her and her eyes are milky white. And she sits down she says, hey, what is your name? She says, I have no name. She says, no, you've got a name. She says, I have no name. And the lady that was sitting next to her says, she has no name, and she's blind. And she sees her just sitting in this hot sun, and and it dawns on her. She's like, you know, I want to tell her about God's love, but not yet. You know, and and she looks at her, and she says, well, I want to give you a name. I'm going to give you the name, and it's very precious to me because my daughter's name is Atalia. She says, I want to give you the name Atalia, Utalia, U-T-A-L-I-A. She said, it means joy, and you exist. I want to give you the name, you exist, and you have joy. And she goes over and she reaches, she sits with her, and she hugs her. And as she does, as she begins to hug her and just tell her how much her God loves her, her eyes go from white to gray to brown, beautiful brown, and she can see. And this blind woman can now see. She goes on to tell her the gospel of Jesus, and and I love how she says it. She says, and and, uh, Of course she accepted Jesus. What else are you going to do at that point? (laughs) Because he's so real. See, church, I believe my my Aunt Betty is in heaven right now. But the gospel is way more than that. Because what would even heaven be if you don't have a name? Do you understand that what Jesus did on the cross was he made people whole? The problem with your sin is not just that it sends you to hell. It's that it keeps you from being you. What Jesus did is he restored people and he made them whole. And when you come to Jesus, there's a way in which you come alive. So I'm going to speak some things. I'm going to hand it over to Pastor Matt. But wherever you're at right now, South Florida, online, Auditorium A, someone with stomach cramps for five days, today's your day to be healed. Someone with blurred vision in your left eye, this is your day. Someone with a twisted left knee, painful, this is your day. A lady that's suffering from extreme fear of failure, this is your day. Someone with wheezing lungs, asthma, shortness of breath, this is your day. A lady with a lump in her left breast, this is your day. Someone with lower back pain, this is your day. At all of our campuses, I want the altar prayer team to come up, and I want you to line up, and I'm going to ask you guys to be ready to pray. So prayer team, come on up, Pastor Matt. I'm going to ask you to take it from here. If you need wholeness in spirit, soul, or body, I don't care how long you have to wait, you receive prayer today, we're going to pray for you. If you are not right with Jesus, this is your day to be forgiven and for the kingdom of God to come. Pastor Matt, close this out. Pastor John, you take it. Mike, take, Mike Lane, you take it. Pastor Mike, take it over there in Auditorium A. And if you're online and you need prayer, let one of them know, and may the Lord heal you, and may the Lord save you. And if you need to be baptized, we'll do that today too. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. Pastor Matt.